We see this pattern repeated over and over again in the lives of those who have been transformed by God's steadfast love. We are brought low by our sin and rebellion. We hit rock bottom. We call out to God to save us, and he does. This is season 11 of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace from an Orthodox Wesleyan point of view. God's holy word is essential to our teaching, so let's get into God's word right now. I would invite you to keep your Bibles out, turn in them with me to uh, Psalm 107. Uh, it's page 559 of the Old Testament, if you're following along in the Pew Bible. Psalm 107. We are continuing our journey through the Psalms during the season of Lent. We have seen how the Psalms echo our own lives. In songs of repentance, songs for guidance, cries for help, songs that tell God's glory. Today's psalm is a rather lengthy one, 43 verses, but it has a repeating pattern throughout. And rather than simply constrain ourselves to the few verses in the lectionary, we're going to examine the entirety of it. And in it, we see four pictures of God's salvation. And in those pictures, we can find ourselves, how we came to Christ and how God has saved us from our sin. Now, we already read this responsively. Uh, we're going to go verse by verse through the psalm. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now to receive this word. Almighty God, we quiet our hearts to receive your instruction today. Speak to us in the stillness as we open your holy word to hear what you would say to us today. By your Holy Spirit, fill us with the knowledge of your love for us through Jesus Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. What brought you to God? What is it that caused you to repent and put your trust in Christ? We call this our story. We call this our testimony. And our testimony is our own. I always uh, recommend that when you are talking to non-believers, to use your own testimony. Why? Because... It's your story. It's indisputable. What God has done for you. You experienced it. You lived it. People can't question that. And so I tell my story. I tell my story all the time. And I usually begin by telling people that I was a drug addict, that I was an alcoholic, that my life was a mess, that I had cheated on my first wife, that I had destroyed my, my, my first marriage, that I was an adulterer, that I had participated in abortions. I was the worst sort of person and a person you would not have liked to have met. And yet, in the depths of my agony, at my lowest point, I cried out to God, and God rescued me. Just as, just as Peter began to sink beneath the, the waves and the, and the rolling sea and cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me, Jesus stretched out his hand and brought him into the boat and said, Why did you doubt, O you of little faith? And that was me. I had little faith. I doubted, and yet God rescued me. Because God doesn't depend on anything that we give. What did we read today? In Ephesians, it says, By grace you are saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. God gives you the faith to believe. It's not of works, so that no one may boast. It's all Glory to God. And my story is the same. It's not about what I did to turn my life around. It's about what God did to rescue me from my sin. 
I used to say all the time in high school, without any sadness, without any regret, I used to say, I'll probably be dead by the time I'm 25. And I was fine with that. Well, here I am, still kicking it. 54. God had other plans. God turned my life around, and I don't think it was a coincidence that God turned my life around when I was 24. He didn't let me see 25 before he began to draw me back to him. That's our testimony, okay? We see this pattern repeated over and over again in the lives of those who have been transformed by God's steadfast love. The circumstances might differ, but the overarching theme is the same. We are brought low by our sin and rebellion. We hit rock bottom. We call out to God to save us, and he does. And then we live our lives in gratitude for all of God's wonderful works for our, of salvation. In this psalm today, we can find ourselves and our situations And we are reminded that it is good and right to give thanks to the Lord at all times, in all situations. Just above where it says Psalm 107, you'll see these words, Book 5. I mentioned before that um, the Psalm, uh, the Book of Psalms is actually divided into five books, and this is probably due to scroll length. It could also be because they would maybe they would sing five different psalms and like i said when you have a scroll you open the scroll right where you left off so if you open the first one and you sing that psalm and then you open the second one and you sing that psalm kind of like what we do we sing four uh hymns uh in the course of our worship That's just speculation. I never read that anywhere. I'm just guessing. Why are the Psalms broken up into five books? That's that's a good guess. If I had planned it out, that's probably what I would have done. Yeah, but I didn't. So it's probably not what it is. So I hate to interrupt, but I want to just point out that I did some research, of course, after I delivered this sermon. The reason why the book of Psalms is broken up into five books is because uh, the tradition says it's because of the five books of Moses, which is the the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the book of Psalms is like a Torah, uh, like the Pentateuch, um, in that it has five books and it is instructive or wisdom literature. Anyway, I just wanted to make that clarification and now back to the sermon. At any rate, this is the first psalm that begins the last book of psalms. And as every book does, it opens with a song of praise. Okay? And so the first three verses here are sort of a call to worship, a preamble of what we're going to see. Now, the structure of this psalm is as follows, and I want you to remember this, okay? First, we have this call to worship, verses 1 through 3. And then we have four examples of salvation after sin. That's verses 4 through 32, and we're going to go through each one. And you can see probably in your book, um, they're each broken up into sections, and we're going to go through each one. After those four examples, there is a testimony as to how God chastises his people in sin and then saves them from their sin. And the last verse is a word of advice to us, the people of God. Okay, so let's get into it. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That word there, steadfast love, we've talked about it before. It's the Hebrew word chesed. God's steadfast love, that is, that's the Hebrew equivalent of agape, okay? It's God's unconditional, selfless, giving, sacrificial love that he shows to his people. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. Redeemed is a very churchy word. If we're not careful, we can gloss right over it. We hear it all the time. I'm redeemed. You're redeemed. We're all redeemed. 
Wouldn't you like to be redeemed too, right? What does it mean to be redeemed? To be redeemed means to be purchased back, okay? Redemption is purchasing back what is yours. Think about if you pawn an item. You give a, something to a pawn shop. They give you money. You can give the money back and redeem what, your item, okay? Or they can sell your thing for more than what they bought it for, whatever. Redemption, we think about old Coke bottles. You know, you used to have to pay an extra nickel for a bottle of Coke, and then you would take the bottle back and you would get your nickel back. You re they're redeeming their bottles so that they could hopefully sterilize them and fill them up again. That's what it means to be redeemed. God purchased us. How? In the case of the Hebrews, He sent plagues upon Egypt to redeem them from Egypt from out of slavery. When they sinned, he sent them into uh, exile, but he redeemed them by bringing them back into their land and restoring their temple. And overall, he has redeemed us by sending his own son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Verse 3 says, gathered those he redeemed from trouble. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those who he redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. So this psalm was written in the years after the exile to Babylon, after they had been restored. We see a celebration of the restoration and the reestablishment of worship in Jerusalem. So these first three verses set us up. They're telling us we're getting ready to worship. Let's worship. Let's, let's incline our hearts to the Lord. And then they give us four examples of why. So each of these examples has the same structure. All right. And that's going to help us go through these pretty quickly. So the structure of each of these examples is as follows. First, we see the misery of life without God after sin he has removed his blessing. And then we see, number two, the people repent. And, verse, and that verse is always identical in each of these four. Then we see that God restores the people. We see the restoration happen. And then we see a call to give thanks to God for his steadfast love, his chesed. And again, the first verse of that call to give thanks is repeated word for word. It's identical in each of the four. So let's look at the first one. Verses four through nine. First, we see the misery of life without God. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to, inhabit it, to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about God leading the people through the wilderness. See, the people had rebelled against God when they, they sent spies into the land. And the spies came back and 10 of them had a bad report. Two of them had a good report, Caleb and Joshua. But the people listened to the 10 and they said, there's giants and there's fortified cities and we can't do this and, and, and they will kill us all and they will, they will enslave our children. And so the people cried out against God and they cried out against Moses. And for that reason, not because they were lost, but for that reason, God made them wander in the desert for 40 years because they didn't have faith in him. So they wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then, part two, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. Remember that verse, verse six. You're going to hear that exact same repeated three more times. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. So the people repent. We were wrong, Lord. We need to do what you, we need to trust in you. 
So what did he do? He restores the people. Verse 7, he led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. He brought them into the promised land and he gave them victory over the Canaanites who were there. Now verses 8 and 9, again, a call to give thanks to God for his steadfast love. Let them, and again, verse 8 is going to be repeated. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. That's a repeated refrain. For, and this is specific to this story, he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. They're wandering around in the wilderness. They are, he's constantly providing for them and they are in, you know, in his hands. But he provides for them. He, he brings them into this promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he uh, blesses them abundantly. All right, let's look at the second example. And again, these are testimonies of God's abundant love and his grace and his mercy. Example two, verses uh, 10 through 16. Now, what's in, in, in view here when he says, Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery and in irons, for they had rebelled against the, works of, the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. The picture here is of someone who is in prison. And the person that they're speaking of in this case is uh, King Zedekiah. Zedekiah. He was the last king of Israel before the Babylonian captivity, all right? King Nebuchadnezzar came and he besieged Jerusalem. We read in 2 Kings chapter 25 that a breach was made in the city and all the men of war fled by night. They ran away in the night by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were around the city. And they went in the direction of the Arabah, but... The army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. Here's King Zedekiah. So much for the captain going down with his ship. He was, he was running away and abandoning his people. The army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, at Riblah. And they passed sentence on him. And what is the sentence? This, is, this might be one of the cruelest things I have ever read in my entire life. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. They killed his sons and then they gouged out his eyes. So that was the last thing he saw was them killing his sons. What a horrible, cruel thing. But the problem is that Zedekiah was worshiping false gods. And God turned him over, him and the kingdom of Judah, over to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And we can read about that all in the book of Daniel. So, some sat in darkness and in gloom. He put his eyes out. Prisoners in misery and in irons. He took them in chains back to Babylon. For... Why? They had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. But their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. They fell down with no one to help. And then what happened? Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them from their distress. When they repented of their sin, He restored them. And in fact, Zedekiah was given a place at Nebuchadnezzar's at Nebuchadnezzar's table he was restored now he was blind he's still in chains but he was restored okay he brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds asunder and then the call to give thanks get let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wonderful works to humankind for he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron he frees us he sets us free from our bondage. Now, the third example. The third example, verses 17 through 22, and this, these verses are actually part of the lectionary. The lectionary this week is just 1 through 3 and then 17 through 22. What's interesting is these verses, if this sounds familiar, it's because we read about it in the book of Numbers. Numbers. 
And Jesus alluded to it. Okay, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, what do we see? The people rebel against God. God sends fiery serpents that begin to bite the people. They call out to God. Moses, God tells Moses, put a fiery serpent up on a pole. And if anybody is bitten by a poisonous snake, they can look at the serpent on the pole and live. Now that's an act of faith, isn't it? And it's a picture, Jesus uses that as a picture of his own salvation. He says, just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, and those who looked at it would live, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who look to him will live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so with that in mind, let's look at this. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction by snakes. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. That's exactly what they said in, in the reading today. Uh, we have no food and we have no water and we hate this food. Well, how can they hate the food if they don't have any food? You eat the same thing for 40 years and tell me how you feel. You know, manna in the morning, manna in the evening, manna around supper time. You know, manna, 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 manna. How many, time, how many different ways can you, can you make manna, right? Bread from heaven. But it was food. It was sustenance. It kept them <clears throat> sustained for 40 years. They were just tired of it, you know? Um... I know people who they complain if they get leftovers. You know, I love leftovers. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm just crazy that way, I guess. But, you know, if it was good enough to eat the one time, I want to eat more of it, you know? So leftovers are fine with me. But 40 years of leftovers, maybe not so much. So they loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then, here's that verse again. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. There's the deliverance. And then the thanksgiving. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And why? And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Now verse 23. Some people suspect that this is um, a picture of Jonah, okay? So Jonah, we all know the story of Jonah, and Jonah is a story that I identify with very closely because Jonah was given <clears throat> a mission by God to go to Nineveh and speak a word, and he didn't want to do it. So he went in the exact opposite direction. He went to Tarshish instead. But along the way, God raised up a storm to the point where the sailors were freaking out and they were calling upon their gods, little g-gods. And they went to uh, Jonah and said, you know, why aren't you praying? He was, down in the, he was down in the belly of the ship. He was sleeping. Kind of like a picture of Jesus on the stormy sea. And he says, well, you know, the storm is because of me, because I'm fleeing from God. And they're like, well, what, do you, what should we do? He says, just throw me in the ocean, and it'll be over. And they didn't want to do it, so they're trying to row. And the more they rowed, the, the fiercer the storm got. And then finally, they prayed to this God that they don't even know, this God, Yahweh. And they said, do not hold this sin against us. And they threw Jonah into the sea, and the sea was calm. And they feared the Lord. Now think about that. Some went down into the sea in ships doing business in the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. I love this picture. It's very poetic. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Think of the rolling sea, the waves going up and down, up and down, right? They reeled and uh, their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards 
and were at their wit's ends. What did they do? Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So now those are our four examples and they're examples from scripture. They're examples from stories that we know from the Bible. And now the psalmist begins to tell us some other stories, and, and these might seem familiar as well. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the wickedness of his inhabitants. Some people suspect he might be talking about the drought, the famine that happened during the reign of Ahab when Elijah said there will be no more rain until I say so. Three and a half years. But then what happens? He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry live and they establish a town to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. So you see when... when when there's repentance, there's restoration and there's blessing. Verse 29, we go back to the sin and the separation. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of distress and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness stops its mouth. So what we're seeing here is God chastising his people, not to be a punishing God, not to be a vengeful God, but to bring his people back to him. He uses this chastisement to draw people back to himself. When we are brought low, when we are at rock bottom, the only place we can look is up. And the only thing we can do is reach out to him and say, Lord, help me. And he helps us. He restores us. He humbles us. And then he reaches out his hand and says, come up here. Now the last verse, verse 43 let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the, of the Lord. The steadfast love, the hesed of the Lord. It's advice in, to praise God and to submit to him. Compare this to Ecclesiastes. Solomon spends 12 chapters telling us how meaningless life is without God. And then the last two verses of Ecclesiastes says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so we're, we're admonished, we are encouraged let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins with knowing who God is and giving him his due praise. So in this psalm, we see four historical examples of God's chastisement after sin and his salvation after repentance. In these four examples, we could see ourselves and our rebellion to God because before we were saved by the life-giving blood of Christ. Our particular situations may have been different, but the overarching theme is the same. We rebel against God in our sin, and we struggle in this world apart from Him. And one day our eyes are open, and we realize the foolishness of our actions. We cry out to God in repentance, and He restores us to a relationship with Him. And more than that, 
He adopts us as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters of Christ our Lord and heirs of the promise of salvation. Let us consider this matter today as we worship our God and King that his love is demonstrated to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is salvation. This is restoration. Let us consider the steadfast love of the Lord and rejoice in the testimony of our salvation. Let us pray. Father God, we adore you for your grace, mercy, and love. You have given to us life and breath and everything we need. And when we rebelled against you in our sin, you left us to our own devices. The world offers us nothing apart from your presence. And so we turn to you in humility and repentance and you restore us. You bring us into your family and you comfort us in our weakness. Receive our praise today and every day that you would be glorified, that we would be your people and that you would be our God. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I hope that this teaching has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. God has also blessed me by calling me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey. Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. If you live in the area and don't have a church to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings for a Bible-based and God-honoring worship. Ebenezer meets for worship at 9 a.m. and Hudson meets for worship at 10.30. We also have Sunday school available and Bible study during the week. Now this podcast is self-funded and we never ask for donations. It reaches people all around the world, but it could reach more people if you do a couple of things, and it won't cost you a penny. First, subscribe to the podcast and our YouTube channel. Leave a comment and also like the podcast. That puts the podcast in front of more people so that the gospel may reach them as well. Keep learning, keep growing, and I pray you will listen to Guerrilla Christianity again. Until next time, remember this, Christ died for you. Now go live for Christ.